This is a disaster. Stop it. Be honest with yourself. Is this you? Is it you? There's no shame in it. There's a little bit. What's going on, guys? I didn't quite realize just how many of my students had massive preflop leaks that I didn't know about until I started looking at their preflop game. Fortunately, preflop is a really easy area to fix. And so in today's video, we're going to spend our time making sure that we sure up five potential holes in our preflop game and just increase our EV by doing very minimal work. Let's get started. So guys, what we see on our screens right now is a 25 NL rake structure range. It's basically saying that Queen 10 offsuit the hand I've highlighted from the hijack, this is a hijack opening range in orange here, the grey hands are folding preflop, is break even. We have the lovely EV display on screen here as well, as we can see down here. And this is so important to have because it lets you see how sensitive hands are going to be to different swings. And one of the things we're going to talk about in great detail today is how you should actually adjust preflop ranges for real life circumstances that greatly change the EV of your decisions. But first I want to give you the lay of the land, I want to make sure that you're familiar with the display that's going to be on your screen for this educational video. What we see here is a hand grid, and as we can see there are lots of mixed actions here. These are basically going to be the break even points, so if I was to click on King 4 suited, lo and behold that hand is 0 EV to open. If I go to King 5 you can see that it's winning microscopically so the solver is opening it all the time. If I move up in the hand grid and select like King Jack suited, it's now winning significantly. This is actually 0.18% of a big blind. So you're actually throwing away a fifth of a big blind in this spot. That's a lot of money. You know, that's not to be taken lightly. That's 20 big blinds every 100 times the spot comes up, which will take a long time. But there will be many spots like this that come up every 100 hands. So this is something you want to be aware of. It is a fallacy when people say you're losing 20 BB per 100 by folding here. You're losing 20 BB per 100 times. This happens. Right, just be careful there. People love to pull the wool over your eyes there and make you think something's way worse than it is. They love to be scaremongers, just like the media. Guys, watching a carrot poker school training video is like getting an elite academic education in cash game poker that you simply cannot get anywhere else. If studying poker was like studying, say, law, for instance, then choosing the carrot poker school would be like getting into the top law school in the country. Imagine getting 33 lectures from such an establishment for less than a thousand pounds. Most poker players struggle because they simply lack the theory necessary to understand the mechanics of this complex game properly. They get disorganized, random content and rely on the advice of peers in study groups and forums who are also struggling. The Carrot Poker School gives you all of the material you need to achieve your wildest poker dreams. The rest is up to you. To pick up the Carrot Poker School today, click the top link in the description, head on over to CarrotConnor.com, add it to your cart, go to checkout, make a payment and you are done within 10 seconds. You can then download all of our videos and get ready to start your full scholarship. Let's get back to the action. So anyway, we have the ability here to bounce between different hands. This is a program called Simple Preflop. I sell solved ranges that were actually created by this program. It basically churned away for like three days straight on my powerful computer. Flex, brag, blah, have big computer. And the reason it did that is I wanted to bring you a product that was actually accurate for different rake structures. So if you head over to carrotconnor.com and go to our store, you can pick up a complete set of solve ranges for any spot you like at all that you can imagine in the game tree and you'll get them as a PDF with corresponding text file. If you ask me nicely and, and shoot me a message, I can even send you over a file that you can open in Simple Preflop. You can get that for free as a little bonus. So yeah, let's head on over to our first slide for today because there are five lessons here on how you can improve preflop. As I said in the intro, I didn't quite realize just how many of my students had significant preflop errors in their game until I started peering into their preflop a little bit. And yeah, it's actually quite crazy how bad people are at the easiest street in poker. This is definitely the easiest street, but there are some things we want to do to make sure we play it well. So let's get into that. If you guys have followed my content for any amount of time at all, you may well have heard my kind of cheesy slogan that this is Carrot Corner, as you can see at the top left there in the logo, not Parrot Corner. When you wander through a pet store, for example, and I've had this experience myself in my life, and there's some kind of like parrot or budgie or parakeet or something like in a cage and it's perched up there, it's watching all the customers and it's like, hey you, you're good looking, you're good looking, or something like this. Like people teach these parrots to like compliment the customers and shit. Don't like get them to insult them generally, it's not good for business. When it tells you you're good looking, and you may well be, you know, I'm not here to accuse you of not being good looking. That's the last thing I would do. 
but the parrot doesn't actually know that. Like while it can see you and it probably does have some aesthetic judgment on, on your looks, it doesn't know that it's articulating that judgment when it says, hey, you're good looking or whatever it happens to say to you. If you go up to that parrot and you then say, why thank you, you're not so bad looking yourself, what are you up to today? It's likely gonna say something like, hello, or give me nuts. It's not going to have an intellectual or even just coherent logical conversation with you. It has learned to reproduce things that it's heard. It learns audially. And the preflop equivalent of this for the poker player is that we visually reproduce things that we've seen. And the trap here is if we get completely bogged down in memorization, just rote memorizing ranges preflop and things like that, we end up falling into the trap of just forgetting to be fluid, forgetting to deviate. So often you're going to want to react to changes in the pool. So parrot learning is a way of learning ranges where instead of deriving meaning, instead of forming patterns from the ranges you're looking at, you actually just start rote memorization. Let's take a look at what that would actually look like. What we see here is the solver's reaction to being on the button, opening 2.5 big blinds, getting three bet to 12 big blinds by the big blind, and this is the approach. So if we look, look, look at a hand like pocket queens, we can see that folding would be minus 2.5 big blinds for the hand, the solver here tells us. The EV for the whole hand, we should understand that the EV from point of decision here is zero but that's just how it measures things here. So the goal here when defending is not to have plus EV from the point of view of the entire hand, but to be doing better than we would be doing by folding. So anything that's more positive than negative 2.5 big blinds here is going to be good. So when we look at a hand like ace queen off, it's interesting, right? This hand is actually losing money by defending because you've already thrown out some money here and you've been three bet and that's not a good thing for ace queen off. Even though you have to defend, it's not a good thing. You shouldn't feel happy about it happening much better when they just fold, right? You have really positive EV. Nevertheless, it's much better to continue this hand. It's a very strong hand against the range here, and it's much better to continue that than it is to fold it. With Ace Jack, this hand is a mix because all of the options are now roughly the same EV. Four bet in orange, call in green, and fold in gray. But parrot learning here would be to say, Ace Jack is a mix. I'm gonna mix Ace Jack. I'm gonna four bet it 30% of the time or, or learning. I don't even care what this is. I don't even look into what this is. In my solve ranges, I don't even give you the exact, in the PDF chart, I don't even give you the exact frequency. I just give you the picture so you can see roughly what it is because the exact frequency doesn't matter. If you're learning like a parrot, you might be learning something like Ace Jack is a 30% four bet, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. There's no magical, you know, storm from the poker gods that rains cash on you because you replicate the same frequency that the gods were deciding was right. Like, it doesn't work that way. It's useless to try to memorize the frequency with which Ace Jack off is four betting. That frequency will change when you change one of the inputs to your sim slightly. These things are very sensitive. What's important is the EV. So when you're learning here, you should understand where the threshold is for breaking even when it comes to flatting the three bet. You should understand where the threshold is for four betting with respect to value and with bluffing. So if you know, for example, that tens is normally a mix, but then you think your opponent is someone who is way too tight and jams over four bets a lot, you now know that four betting is terrible and you should never do it. And that's much better than just being like, ha, huh, I recall that it's 20% four bet, so I'm going to roll it. So it's really important here to, to just learn why things are what they are. Why does ace-8 get to four bet here, but jack-8 suited doesn't, right? Understanding that it's to do with the blockers, that these hands can four bet bluff because they have the best blocker possible, the ace preflop. Understanding that is very important. If you were to four bet here with king-5, in this rake structure against big blinds, you make a small mistake, right? You lose like 14% of a big blind, as we can see here. However, if you actually thought that your opponent was way too bluff heavy with the three bets, this could now be winning, right? So there's lots of ways that this can swing. But the point is that you should never be trying to memorize charts. Students often ask me, what's the best way to memorize the range charts? And I say, don't. Leaf through them, study them, browse them, derive meaning, take hand examples, predict what you think the hand should do, how close the EV will be, always look at the EV, and then reference it in your charts. Do not plaster them all over your walls. I've had students like buy my ranges and be like, look, Pete, I've put them all over the wall of my bedroom. I've put them on the bathroom mirror. I mean, like maybe if you're just going to glance at them and have that gradual subconscious learning seeping into your brain, but not if you're going to stare at them and be like, okay, queen jack, 20%, queen jack, blah, 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 blah. Just don't do that. Just don't do it. No parrot learning. Guys, IO versus Population is an educational strategic e-magazine on No Limit Hold'em cash games that you can grab over at carrotcorner.com. It breaks down the theory behind some of the most common and important spots for your win rate. 
making solver outputs understandable and digestible so that you can see why the solver is playing the hands the way it chooses to do so. With Pio vs Population, you never have to feel lost like you're staring at a meaningless sea of hand charts because we'll break down the logic behind every strategy we recommend. But not only that, the most lucrative thing about Pio vs Population is that for every spot we cover, we show you how your opponents are likely to go wrong. This means you can craft a really effective exploitative strategy and punish them to devastating effect. You can learn how to master a key spot, not just theoretically, but exploitatively too, for just $9.99 an episode. Or why not pick up our mega bundle and save £50 in the process? You never need to feel lost again in those tricky common spots with Pio vs Population, e-magazine for No Limit Hold'em cash games available only at caracorner.com. Now let's get back to the action. One of the things that I think is the most misplayed, one of the nodes that's the most misplayed in the whole game tree, as far as I'm concerned in my students game, is big blind versus small blind. Why? Because the strategy that's actually required here in game theory is way more polarized and quite unnatural. It's far more polarized, sorry, than like what I think people are comfortable with or what seems intuitive. So let me go ahead and show you what a big blind versus small blind 3-bit range looks like and explain why. So there's a lot of intricacies to understand here, but the overwhelming pattern for this range, big blind 3-betting against the 3x small blind open, is going to be about polarization. There's a concept of squandering that I want to talk about here, to squander the EV of a hand that's really good to call. Let's look at 10-8. This hand is not really good to call, but it is better than folding. So if you have 10-8 here against a player that's playing in a theoretically fine way and you're playing a normal range and they're playing normally post flop and there's no like crazy stuff going on, you can expect the EV of this hand to be slightly worse to fold than it would be to call and the 3-bet EV should be about the same as the call EV. Now obviously when we 3-bet this hand we're relying on fold equity, right? But people don't really piece that together. They're like, I have better bluffs, I have better hands. And the better hands fallacy is something we talk about all the time in the carrot poker school, but it's basically this idea that you want to bluff in a linear way where you just use like the biggest, bulkiest draws in your range post-flop first when you're like raising the flop or something like that. And it doesn't necessarily work that way. You can have higher EV bluffs and lower EV bluffs here. And the idea is that as long as the hand isn't inferior to 3-bet than it is to do something else with it, then you can 3-bet, right? So 10-8 is just a worse hand overall than something like, I don't know, let's pick a hand that's 3-betting here that's a bit better than 10-8, like Queen-10. But the thing is, if you look at the EV of Queen-10, the EV of both calling and 3-betting is much, much better. It's now only losing 0.45 big blinds. Remember, folding is worth minus a whole big blind, so that's the worst option of all. With 10-8, that's also the case, but now calling and 3-betting are basically very close to that as well. So it doesn't actually matter how good 10-8 is compared with Queen-10. So thinking like, oh, I don't want a 3-bet 10-8 because I could have Queen-10 and that's a better bluff. No, it's a better hand. It's not a better bluff. We talk about this a lot in the Carrot Poker School. So preflop, this very much applies. Squandering would be the opposite of this. It would be when you have a hand that's actually very good to call, let's say Jack-9 suited. Look what happens here in theory when you 3-bet Jack-9 suited, you actually hemorrhage a lot of money. It's 0.5 losing to 3-bet here, but only 0.4 of a big blind to call. And the idea is that this hand performs so well as a call, even though 3-betting is much better than folding, and if given the choice you would 3-bet this before you would fold it, you don't want to be squandering this hand and turning it into a bluff in position, reopening the action, getting 4-bet sometimes, etc., when you could just flat and do very well. So you need to be really careful here. You need to get over a certain mental block. I guarantee you that 90% of you watching this right now who play like below 100 NL are probably suffering from this. And when you're dealt hands like 10-4, Jack-4, Jack-3, etc., you are just not 3-betting them at high enough frequency. It doesn't have to be these hands. You know, if you find another hand that's really similar, let's say we went to like the 9-6 here, you can see, okay, that one's actually a bit too good. This one, 9-5, is very close between 3-betting and not 3-betting. There'll be some other hands, like with the jack or 10 remover to the 4-betting range. Like, you don't want to get 4-bet bluffed, right? So it's good to block 4-bet bluffs here as well in your opponent's range. Things like Ace-10, King-10, whatever kind of hand they may be 4-bet bluffing you with. One thing I would say here is that if you don't find these lousy offsuit King X and Ace X, if you don't find these suited Jacks and suited Tens, your 3-bet range becomes like this linear mess. You're just way too strong. 
your opponents will see that eventually that your three bit stat is too low and then you'll stop getting action right that's like the theoretical penalty of course that doesn't happen against all player types but it will happen against the stronger regs who are tracking the way you play with a hud or whatnot another thing i want to throw in right now in the video is that if you're watching this and you are thinking that your ranges that you have on, on gto wizard or some other program or range charts that you've been using from your coach aren't the same as this that's okay I don't actually care and I won't be responding to any comment just so you guys know there'll be like a, a few comments that will be of the nature of my range is different my range says the frequency is like no one cares like I don't care and the reason for that is that if you change these frequencies slightly it just doesn't matter the EV won't be way different maybe you're using a different rake structure maybe the strategy is a bit different it doesn't matter what matters is Eevee. So if, even if you get a really good looking hand like Queen Jack here and the solver says, okay, look, there's a 9% of a big blind difference between call and three bet in this rake structure. That is mostly going to be because, well, one, you want to be a bit more polarized than that, but two, the rake is actually quite high in terms of rake cap. So when you're building really big pots, you fail to reach the rake cap and it just penalizes you all the way up and you pay a lot of rake. So keeping pots smaller with decent hands is the theme of high rake structures. That's why these may be different to ranges you're looking at that are based on like 500 NL rake for some reason like a year or two ago somebody published a 500 solve that they'd done with Munker Solver or something and it became like the range that everybody used for every stake like it's completely like belligerently but obviously when you change the rake it does change the output but it doesn't necessarily massively change the EV anyway with that rant aside let's move on to point three it's really, really important, guys, to react to EV swings. What you have to understand is that the circumstances under which these ranges that we're studying today were created are not the same circumstances under which you're playing your session. So when you look down at the table and you're on the button, for example, let's just navigate to a button range now and I'll show you what I mean. So say you look down at this spot and you've got a vague idea in your head of, of what kind of range you want to be raising here. I, I will stress that we don't advocate that you use our range charts or any range charts while you're playing. It is, in my opinion, a form of cheating. I'll happily discuss that with you if you disagree. But having a solution plastered on your wall beside you when you're playing poker, it's unethical for sure. So if you're sitting there with a range chart and you're like, oh, I'm just going to copy this. It's on my other screen. Like no one will know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. You'll probably get away with it. I don't know. Depends how you're doing it. But you are kind of taking an unfair edge. I mean, it's a, it's a topic for discussion. Maybe this is some bait for you guys out there that do that, that want to like jump down my throat. Go ahead. I mean, we can talk about it. But yeah, it's my opinion. Anyway, you're recalling it from memory, right? You've not like got it on your screen, hopefully. And you're deciding what to do with a hand like 9-6 suited. And you recall from your parrot learning that hopefully not, but let's say that there's an unfortunate student that used parrot learning and, and remembers that 9-6 suited is a fold. It's a pure fold, 100% fold on the button. Sometimes the chat pros come into my stream and they're like, this hand never raises. As if like if it raised sometimes it would only be a little bit bad. No, no my friend. If it raises ever, it's break even at least. If it pure raises, it's winning. And if it pure folds, it's losing. But look how much it's losing. 0 0.004 of a big blind. That's the same as 0.4% of a big blind. If my math is right, it may not be. It's basically break even. So if I turn the opponent in the big blind, yeah, magic wand, make him into a, a weaker player, a terrible player, a bad player, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Someone that's too tight, someone that's too stationary, post swap, someone that is too terrible at poker that you just have like a, a reasonable skill edge against, like hopefully you guys, even if you're losing at like 10 NL, which you may be because the rake is unreasonable and you shouldn't play that stake, but maybe you're losing at 10 NL, but you're playing against someone who's losing way more than you are at 10 NL, you still have a big skill edge and you should be adapting here. The rake structure it doesn't actually hurt you from opening wide it just maybe means you don't want to play as many massive pots because the rake cap that's super unreasonable so anyway with nine six suited you should open and if you fold here you have made a massive mistake once you transform villain into someone who doesn't three bet enough plays badly gives you like loads of implied odds with tons of stuff post flop doesn't raise c bets enough the list goes on your EV is probably like 0.4 of a big blind positive. It's probably as good as opening like King Jack off or something like that. That's actually only 0.2. Maybe it's against a normal player. It could easily be. So I want you guys to imagine if you have a massive skill edge against an opponent and you fold a hand that's like just outside your normal opening range, that might be like folding King Jack off against a good player. That's stupid, right? That's terrible. So please be aware of swings. You don't get any gold medals for following charts, just like the parrot in the pet store who like compliments the customers, the ones that can see through that, know that the parrot isn't actually being nice, it's probably a dickhead, yeah? 
but if you don't realize that you end up parrot learning all of this and it actually forms a kind of rigidity in your game where you feel like it's harder to move away from that it's harder to make fluid adaptations what i would recommend doing is just going through the opening range looking at all of the hands that are barely losing or breaking even look at these hands are losing like three percent of a big blind i'm telling you that'll get wiped out so quickly three percent of a big blind is not that much king seven three percent of a big blind right if you look at queen jack here and then queen 10 that's the difference between queen jack and queen 10 three percent of a big blind that was really lucky that i just picked two hands that had that exact gap in ev look 11 to to 14 percent of a big blind but that's so illustrative because it shows you that you know clearly having a terrible player in the big blind is worth more much more than the difference between queen jack and queen 10 therefore by deductive logic if you don't open eight seven now you blunder you blunder my friends you blunder you don't just make a mistake, you toss away tons of EV. How many of you are doing this? Hands up. Lift your hand up right now. No one will see you, it's fine. Just do it. Be like me. If you did that, you're a fucking legend, by the way. If you actually sat there watching this and went like this, you are a true legend because you're being completely open and transparent with yourself and you're letting your ego completely step aside there. If you were like, no freaking raising my hand for this guy, then probably you just have tons of thought process and learning leaks and maybe you're doomed. Sorry, man, you're probably doomed probably completely destined to to failure what can i say i hope you raised your hand next time you'll know right you'll know to raise your hand jokes aside that was half a joke half serious you are going to really destroy your ev if you're not flexible enough i'll give you another example let's skip to a spot where we face a three bet now this one is cutoff versus button cutoff is opened button has three bet and cutoff has the chance to four bet or call and i want you to imagine that you are actually against some weaker player who didn't three bet to 7.5 as the sim is done here against your 2.5x open, but that they made it 10, and they're a recreational player who's not done much so far. Let's pick a hand, ace-jack. Solver says this is a mix between four betting and folding. As long as you don't call, you can't make a mistake here. Okay, fair enough, that makes sense. But now when you make villain's range way stronger, make the pot odds way worse, and make the fold equity that comes from your four bet much lower, this is a barbaric play. This is like literally stupid, senseless play. 4-betting this hand against a 10bb in position 3-bet from a bad player is basically just suicidal. And if you make that play because the range charts told you to, you really need to think about how EV swings. How negative would it be to 4-bet this hand against a random weaker player that makes it 4x in position, probably losing like a whole big blind? Something like that, maybe two? This is a disaster. So if you're someone who's like, the robot told me to, the robot knows best, I must copy the robot, this is the wrong game for you. You're better off just like studying some binary subject where you don't have to be fluid. Or learn to be fluid. Stop it. Be honest with yourself. Is this you? Is it you? There's no shame in it. There's a little bit. Just kidding. But yeah, you wanna you wanna make sure that you understand what EV is. It's a real life thing. Your EV comes from the real world. It doesn't come from the game theory world. The game theory world serves as a guideline, a baseline to the EV in reality but it's up to you to spot the difference between the two realms, like a spot the difference exercise, yeah? And the differences are really stark. They're not just like, oh, this man has an earring in this picture, but not in this picture. They're way more obvious. It's like in this picture, the man is actually a dragon. Like it's, it's crazy how stark the differences are. Now we move on from the gigantic things that are gonna save you like literally thousands of dollars to things that are just probably gonna make you like a few hundred dollars this year when it comes to playing like 25 NL, but they'll still be important, right? If you play enough volume, disclaimer, that might not happen. You might play bad, you might tell, you might play like five NL and it's impossible to make more than $12 a year, no matter what you do. So yeah, that's up to you, but you will improve your game with this little tip. Three bets small when you are under the gun versus button against an early position or cutoff open. The reason for this is very simple. One, well, there's, there's two reasons for this and they're both quite simple. The first one is that you should be playing a linear range here, right? You're not doing a ton of flatting. So maybe on the button, you're a little bit polarized, but you're mainly just linear. You're three betting roughly from the top down. You're always three betting aces, kings, queens, stuff like that. Let me show you an example of a range actually before we go any further. So here we see a cutoff versus hijack three bet range. I've picked on ace jack once again as a hand that will swing very quickly, right? We can see that calling this hand is, is losing, but three betting it and folding are basically the same. No, you shouldn't care about a bazillionth of a percent for this. If you do, there's something wrong with the way your brain is wired. If you care about that, don't worry about it being red. It's, it's okay, it's zero, yeah. Another thing I would say is if you look at these hands here, right? They're mixing call. They're also three betting. 
mostly this range is linear. It's three betting from the top down. There's a lot of thin value bets here, right? H jack suited, king queen suited, ace queen off, tens, nines, jacks thin-ish value bets. If you go huge, what you actually do to the EV of these hands is you kind of ruin them a little bit because it forces your opponent to play in a bit more of a four bet or fold manner. But secondly, it also just means that you run out of value sooner so villain starts folding a bit more, but that's not necessarily that good for you when you have jacks if you're making your opponent fold sevens more often now, that's not actually a great thing. So you want to make it small enough here that you compensate for the fact that your range is linear and not polarized, that you have a lot of thin value bets, and it's your value bets that drive your sizing. If you have a lot of thin value bets, you want to go smaller. If you have mainly just thick value bets, then you want to go bigger. And that's why when you're the big blind, you go huge, because you're generally just calling your medium strength hands, you're not like three betting tens against under the gun, and you're three betting a very polled range that craves a bigger pot because the value component is nutted, so that's fine. You can drive more fold equity there, that's okay, because you're not going to ruin the UV of your big massive hands. In this spot, you will, if you go too big. The other thing I would say about this is that you need to understand that there are people to act after you who have uncapped ranges and it's going to be very polarizing how they behave. So if you're the, the cutoff and you're 3-betting against hijack, button small blind and big blind are either, if they're recreational they make cold calls sometimes so we'll ignore that for now, but they're either in theory going to 4-bet or they're going to fold, right, for the most part. And if they 4-bet your EV will plummet, it will go way way down, it doesn't matter if they have a bluff or value hand, it, like against their range it does matter but you don't know that, so against their range your EV will plummet, or they will fold, in which case your EV will go up slightly. So it's a very polarising thing that can happen next, they either ruin your EV for the day or they just don't, and why go bigger in that case, right? So when you have lots of uncapped ranges after you and you're not closing the action with your 3-bet that's another reason to make it smaller, because you don't want to run into like aces and just pay more money that you don't have to pay. And finally, learn what your 4-bit bluffs are. This doesn't mean that you have to use them in every situation. You're perfectly allowed to not 4-bit bluff because, as we've said, you think the player is too strong when they 3-bet or not folding enough to 4-bets or reopening with a jam too often if you do 4-bet or something like that. But you want to know what they are in theory because there are so many people that play like 25 NL, 50 NL, etc that basically just fail to 4-bit bluff completely. They just don't do it. They just don't like it. It feels bad. I don't think 4-bit bluffing ever feels right, you know, because you're just dangling all this money out there pre-flop. You know that if you face a jam, you're simply going to have to fold. So, so that definitely sucks. I'm going to finish off now by showing you one of the most underbluffed spots ever. And the reason it's mostly underbluffed is that you have to be kind of crazy in it. You have to do things that are a bit animalistic. So this is small blind against big blind. Again, I don't want you to worry about this. I don't want you to be like, oh, look, a6, but never the other aces. Oh, no. Like, just calm down. It's fine. Just honestly get over it. Just four bet bluff some hands that are around zero EV and it'll be okay. By the way, guys, I'm talking to a very small subset of you when I express this sort of like fed upness of this sort of tone. But I am so sick of people like obsessing about like hand selection and not looking at EV. If you look at EV, you stop caring. The EV differences that you'll see between hands here, between 4-betting and not 4-betting, they're not going to be huge, right? So like this one is like, oh no, Queen 10, like mine isn't using Queen 10. Maybe yours pure folds Queen 10, but like it'll be a tiny swing. So you don't have to worry about it. Basically, this is going to be a spot where you have to be kind of crazy. You have to 4-bet a lot. Ace Jack, Ace 10 is pure here, although again, the, the difference is just microscopic, so you could also just not do that sometimes and it would be okay. But the point is, it's very easy to underbluff this situation. And if you don't 4 bet enough of these hands here, you're going to be allowing Big Blind to 3 bet like lots of random stuff profitably that they shouldn't be able to. Another reason why it's really good to 4 bet here instead of call is that in reality, again, talking about EV swinging, right, and reacting to those swings, people are too linear in the big blind, as I already said. The leaks that apply to you guys, so when I say you guys have X, Y, and Z leaks, you can also read that as your opponents do, because you are your opponents. You're all, like, the same. You're all humans that play similar stakes, right? You're all very predictable in that way. Sorry. Not all of you, but most of you. When you have a hand, such as Ace Jack Off, and you think this hand is a mix, it's probably better to 4-bet than it is to call against a reg at 25 and L. And the reason for that is that that reg likely doesn't defend optimally to 4-bets. Likely 3-bets, too many hands that are linear, like King Jack suited and stuff, King 10 suited, things like this that they shouldn't be but will have a hard time continuing to your 4-bet, and doesn't have enough 3-bet bluffs to make the EV of flatting as good as the solver thinks it is. So you want to be switched on here, you want to be on the ball when it comes to finding exploits against your pool. So I hope overall this has shown you that there's a lot of deviating possible. I will ignore every single comment that's like, oh my sim says this. 
because it'll be different inputs, it'll be different rake structures, it'll be different amount of time it was solved for, it'll be different sizes maybe. I just, I'm not interested in having any of those discussions. I'm just showing you what's fine. And you don't need one exact set of ranges as long as you have a set of ranges that's like roughly based on your rake structure, which is why we sell them that way at Carrot Corner. That's fine. Microscopic differences don't matter. I'll stress that again. I do hope this has shown you that this is non-exhaustive, of course, right, this list, but there are a lot of things you could be doing better pre-flop. The biggest ones are point 0.1 and point 0.3, reacting to swings and not parrot learning, but the other ones are important too, and I could make another like 15 spots that would be equally beneficial to your win rate here. But I'm, I'll leave you to explore that on your own. If you pick up our ranges at carrotcorner.com, you can obviously compare where you're going wrong and stuff. But yeah, adjust. Be sensitive to swings. Don't be the parrot in the pet shop. This has been Pete Clark for Carrot Corner Poker Education, and we'll be back very soon with another video. Have fun fixing your pre-flop, and bye for now.